Romans 16. We were uh, uh, finishing up verse 4, and let's start there and go on down um, to uh, verse number 7. Romans 16, just working through that book right now. And <coughs> the Bible says in verse 4, "...who have for my life laid down their own necks, unto whom not only I give thanks, but also all the churches of the Gentiles." Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. Salute my well-beloved um, Epinatus, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. Greet Mary, who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners, who are of note among the apostles, who also were in Christ before me. And we'll look at these verses, and again, this is just a, a neat chapter that God allowed uh, to have about some thanks and some appreciation for those that served along Paul. Let's uh, be seated. We'll pray. God, again, ask you bless your word. We'll never ask too many times. And you uh, told us to ask for wisdom and you would not uh, um, uh, be lacking and uh, you would braid it not if we ask for it. You give it to us. So I pray for that again as I begin to speak with your word. Help me to handle it um, correctly and not deceitfully. And I pray that you'd put your blessing on it in spite of me. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> the, um, verse 4, I know I mentioned it, but I just can't get over that, that thought of, uh, I, I uh, would be willing to give up my life for the faith and the Lord Jesus Christ if my wife or my kids, hey, man, no problem, let me go and let them stay. Um, for a few people out in the world, hey, I'd give up my life for them. For everyone, for someone in the ministry, yes, there are people that I, I would be just grateful to do. But um, it, it's just a humbling thought for Paul to say they've laid down their, their own necks for Paul's life. And I, again, the Lord Jesus, everybody would say, yes, he already gave me eternal life. I'll lay down my life. But when you start thinking of some other human besides your flesh and blood that you're uh, aligned with, um, that's quite a testament that they appreciated what Paul did for them in their lives. And then Paul says, not only I give thanks, but also the churches of the Gentiles. And I, I don't want to re-preach the whole thing, but just what a, what a blessing, man, that to realize um, when, when uh, they helped Paul, that it helped them all. When you helped Paul, you helped all others come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Brother Ocelli was mentioning uh, so that they had 400 students in their college um, before this last year and all kinds of upheaval in India. Uh, and I just thought, man, that's awesome. That's so such a blessing that um, just warriors and soul winners and ministry people going out. And, and India is the second most populous country of the world, and they're growing faster than China. For years, China has been limiting uh, family size, and you probably heard stories. India just, I mean, just blowing up. There's people everywhere. Uh, they're, they're like the Pelfries. I mean, they have kids all over the place, amen, and, uh, and they're populating uh, and growing, and they're like the Doomies, right? They're just everywhere. Uh, <clears throat> but that, that many Hindus, and, and they want to be a Hindu country, they're limiting uh, Muslims because they don't want to be a Muslim country and they their their government has said we're the only Hindu country in the world and we're going to stay that way but that also limits some of Christianity's work and these uh, converts from Hindu <coughs> you ain't going to stop a Christian that's really a Christian buddy they this persecution I think just fuels the fire and those uh, uh, young preachers go to areas I remember stories um, uh, of just trying to go to the most harshest area to give their life for Jesus Christ and coming from uh, that college and, and the, that, that uh, investment. So, you know, when uh, we give an extra whatever to the Chellies, it's it, how many churches are saying, thank you for helping to train the preacher that's going to come win our village to the Lord. Uh, I, and I know missionary money, uh, sometimes it seems like uh, just a... a I won't say a, an, endless, an endless hole, but it's a hole you don't, a dark hole you don't get to see what happens or what is benefit from that. I was reading a letter from Bearing Precious Seed. Someone gave such a large donation that now they can match funds for up to two hundred and fifty thousand dollars for the next couple of years at Bearing Precious Seed. 
That's amazing. Amazing that uh, that they just, you know, you give $50, it turns to 100 That's better than a stock market, amen, uh, for the Lord Jesus Christ, a bearing precious seed. And how many Bible, it, it, all those things are just a, a wonderful blessing um, that when someone lays down their life for a ministry or for someone else who's ministering neck, it's not just then they give thanks, verse 4, but also all the church of the Gentiles. Okay, here we go in verse 5. It says, Likewise, greet the church that is in their house. I think it's talking about Priscilla and Achilla's house. And it says, Salute my well-beloved. Yeah, you can pronounce his name better than I can, okay? It starts with an E. We'll just call him Big E, okay? And uh, who is the first fruits of Achaia unto Christ. First of all, I just want to mention about this church in their house. Um, who knows what the future will hold with lockdowns and with lowdowns and with things that are going down in our country. I, I'm, I don't know, uh, not to be political, but uh, if you heard, uh, uh, if you watched some of those things, uh, uh, there was a uh, uh, notice about uh, the uh, vaccine passports is like the new segregation of our day. And we are so totally against segregation from the past. But who knows what's going to happen with these things and how it's going to pan out and play out. And uh, um, <clears throat> if, if we get to a place where you need to have church in your house, you ought to know what constitutes a church. It's not just two or three meetings. God's in the presence where if you're two or three together at Kroger, He's there. If, if there's two or three together at, at uh, unfortunately, some place it's not as good as Kroger, He's there. But a church constitutes a, a group of baptized believers who are... Uh, united in the effort to carry out the Great Commission. That was what we would define as a church. I believe that Christ is in you whether you're part of a church or not if you're saved. He moved in and He took possession of, of you. But when you get a few of those AA batteries together, it produces more voltage. You know what I'm talking about? You can put some batteries together. I didn't realize that, but that's what a bigger battery is, just a bunch of smaller batteries put together in, a, in one housing. I used to think, man, I want one of them 9-volt batteries. Just put nine little double A's together, and, and you can get that voltage. That's what happens when you get Christians together in the body of Christ. We have Christ in us the day we're born again. But when you're baptized into a body and become a part of that, there's just there's something corporate about that that's different than the individual part of a believer. And so this church that met in their house, I don't think that meant that they were just having house church without anybody else. I think they were having people be a part of the church that met in their house. And uh, not, not to um, be judgmental of things, but I'm just telling you, when, when uh, we take away the corporate meaning of church, you're missing God's plan of involving and reaching others in the church setting. When you're saved, brother, God's not leaving. You're going to heaven whether you like it or not. You're in the factory that God is going to destine you now that you're saved. You've got eternal security. So church is not about making sure you get to heaven. Church is making sure others get to go to heaven. That's the part of church that's uh, so of, of utmost importance. Um, I'm thankful. I never even met those kids that were down junior church last Sunday. I don't even go downstairs on Sunday morning. Praise the Lord. No, no, thank, no, no I, I can't say praise or thank the Lord there. But uh, other people are, are ministering, reaching them, and it's because we got a collection of a church. I, was, I got the voicemail, and, and I tried to reach out yesterday. I'm going to do it as soon as church is over. But uh, some lady called during the early service and said, hey, can someone pick up my boy to come to Sunday school? Which we didn't get that. It was during the early service in church. But um, how can we do that if, if it's just my house? I can't uh, fit everybody in there. No, one, no more people want to come to my house if I was having church with my family and kids. But when you put a, a bunch of us together, and then it even broadens the scope and widens the, the reach for the cause of Christ. Amen? And so uh, this church that met in their house, it wasn't that they were just having house church with no other family. No, it was a church constituting what we define that as that was meeting in that specific house. If that were to happen, um, I, I'm not to, you know, I'm just saying, we need to have church. We need to, to keep reaching out and open up the doors for people to come. And if you have to have it and uh, group us in small, hey, we're going to keep finding a way to do it until the Lord comes and takes us home.
Next thing. It says, greet the church that's in their house. Salute my well-beloved, who is the first fruit of Achaia unto Christ. Now, I'm just going to be honest. Uh, I try to preach the uh, text and trying to find all the messages in this chapter is uh, uh, a little bit of a, uh, of a, a preacher um, uh, a gymnastic event, okay? But uh, I've got three points for you. First fruits, fellow prisoners, and first in Christ, okay? So first of all, let's look at this first fruit. Um, the word first fruit in the Greek in the New Testament has to do with the beginning of sacrifice. And you think about it, anybody that farms or plants or does things, there has to be some investment, some involvement, and some important things that are out of your control before you're going to get any fruit from that field. Uh, drove, I haven't been driving by Milford Avenue because I've been going the bypass from south get, to get up here. And uh, I met uh, Brother Blaine to, to get some things loaded out this morning. So I went by the, um, the, the, the land that we own on Milford Avenue. And there's alfalfa planted there. Now, if you're not a farm person, alfalfa is the premium of hay. Amen. That is the, that's the good stuff. And I looked, and that stuff has grown so big, I thought, boy, the farm's going to be excited about bailing that. So I, I told Brother Roush to call the farmer and say, hey, I'm going to bush hog that for you so you don't have to worry about mowing it down and just teasing a little bit. But the, it's grown up, and, and it'll be the first fruit of all the investment of seed, all the investment of, of work, when they mow that and bale that, and that's the first fruit, and it's the beginning of sacrifice, it's an exciting thing. Um, uh, not that the second or third born in a family are any less important, but, you know, that first born, the, the mother's a little more uh, uh, careful and a little more uh, uh, concerned about who's uh, holding, touching, and, and uh, never forget when we had Taryn and Marianne and Lonnie were new to the church, and I met them and talked with them, and, and I was uh, out front with the, the little little carrier, and, and Marion said, can I hold your baby? I'm like, yeah, and Marion was holding, and Courtney came out and said, who's got my baby? Right there when uh, Taryn was just born, and Marion said, I can see the look of distrust on your wife's face when, uh, who's got my kid, and, and, and who do you know, and, and, and did you do a background check, and, and all those things. Now Judson, like, who's got Judson? Anybody know where he's at? Oh, somebody's, oh, as long as somebody's watching him, back now they just got out, it don't matter. Not that, but you know what I mean. The first fruit is just that excitement and that initial result of the investment. Let me give you some uh, thoughts about this first fruit. Um, in this one it says <clears throat> that the first fruit um, of Achaia unto Christ. Can you imagine Paul's... Uh, new to a town and begins to go around to the synagogue and, and try to, to weasel his way into somebody's uh, uh, conversation, and, and then somebody believes the resurrection. And he's thinking, wow, what an awesome thing. Somebody is believing the truth that he's telling. In Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, they, he, he talks about how some uh, looked at him as evil or deceivers. Uh, many people looked at him as dishonorable because of the message he was preaching. And we still have some of that. But that was a new town and a new doctrine and a, a new testament. Buddy, a new believer would have been hallelujah, 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 praise you the Lord. No wonder that he remembers that this guy's name, the first fruits of Achaia. I remember the first guy I got saved at Bible Baptist Marysville on the altar that uh, Brother Rick and Terry and whoever else we made back there, Brad Davenport, knelt down at that altar, the verse pig roast. He'd been visited a few times with Cheryl and then uh, knelt down and got saved after service on that altar. Oh, I remember the first guy I got saved in this building. He was up on a scissor lift right around that uh, light bulb there and there was more going on just the lights as Will was witnessing to him. I remember... Uh, uh, a bunch of first fruits, first people. Um, Taylor was up here dedicating her and Jeff's uh, newest baby, but I remember when Taylor was one of the first teenagers at an activity in the middle of town, uptown at a rented office space that we had, and what well, we played video games. We played Wii Bowling. That was the activity, and uh, uh, Taylor was there, and I don't know if she got saved that night, but it was shortly after. The first fruits... It's not like that, that soul is more important than someone else's. Y'all say amen. 
Taryn is not more important than Judson. But there's just something about the beginning of sacrifice that you remember. Paul remembers that. And the Holy Ghost is the inspiration of Scripture. And salute my well-beloved who is the first fruit. Go to James chapter 1. Let me give you some, some just uh, thoughts about first fruits. James chapter 1, verse number 18. Sorry, Will, let's start in verse 16, if he's putting it on the screen there. James chapter 1, verse 16. Do not err, my beloved brethren. Every good gift and every perfect gift is from above, and cometh down from the Father of lights, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Of his own will begat he us with the word of truth, that we should be a kind of first fruits of his creatures. Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear and slow to speak and slow to wrath. Any of us that are found with faith are a first fruit of the Lord and of His will when we got born again. First fruit of His creatures. When you get saved, and I know God did, God did it, uh, we're born again by His uh, a will, not our own. Um, but yet we've uh, said yes to Jesus who already said yes to us. And so when you're saved... Do the beginning of, of the sacrifice uh, that the Lord invested and planted into this, uh, this God-forsaken place, we could say, uh, with, with all uh, uh, literal meaning. And then when someone comes to know, man, look at, the, look at the fruit of what we planted and what we invested for that to happen. Your faith is a kind of first fruit. Look at Romans chapter 11. Romans chapter 11. And I'm going to keep speaking on this topic until, <clears throat> until um, um, the Lord calls us home. But I don't know if you've noticed anti-Semitism becoming more popular, more prevalent, more public, more acceptable. Now politicians are saying, well, we don't have to be anti-Semitic to be against the Israeli government. Oh, 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 that sounds great. There's only one Jewish state in the whole world. And uh, you're against what their government decides for the people? Yeah, you're not anti-Semitic. No way. <clears throat> uh, th this is going to become more popular and more prevalent. The Bible tells us that the Jews will be hated of all nations. And, and, and just, it's, just, it's just there. And, and it's going to be one of our um, barometers of where we're at in the Bible. Uh, I am sad to say that uh, if you listen uh, to any news broadcast, not only do you hear uh, anti-Semitic Semitic things there, you hear positive abominations, uh, uh, pride festivals, and all. Marysville has one this coming Saturday. Somebody said, it's amazing we didn't have a Memorial Day parade, but we can have a pride festival in the same, same town. Now, I know the city's not putting it on, but they sure have signed off to let it happen in the middle of town. Where are we at, Lord Jesus? When are you coming to receive us to yourself? There's just barometers of that thing. Romans 11, why I'm on the subject. Romans 11, verse 16. And I'm not just trying to curse the darkness. I'm just trying to tell you this is the circumstance where we're at. Um, believing whatever evangelical faith, faith, people of faith, we are one, we're wanted, we are been tried to be put into this one category where, where we can be hated and dismissed and, and disregarded because we're the ones holding back progress for the rest of the world. Mark it down. Just listen to the news. Uh, people of faith are the ones who are holding back vaccinations. That's what, they're, that's what they're trying to sell, even though it's not true statistically. But that's what they're trying to sell. It, Romans 11, um, I don't know where that's all coming from. You're just getting it fuel, full blow here. Romans 11, 16, let me get to the Bible. For if the first fruit be holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root be holy, so are the branches. And if some of the branches be broken off, and thou being a wild olive tree were grafted in among them, and with them partakers of the root and fatness of the olive tree, 
Boast not against the branches, but if thou boast, thou bearest not the root, but the root thee. It's talking about how the Gentiles are grafted in to God's plan. Because the original plan of God to reach the world is through Israel. That was his plan to use Abraham to be a messenger and to manifest God through that first fruit or the, the tree of Israel. We Gentiles are grafted in, not to the nation of Israel, but to the plan of God to reach the world. It's the church that God's using during this time. And he just reminded us, we're grafted in. We're not the natural way. We're not the uh, original way to reach the world. We're the New Testament. And so he's saying, hey, don't, don't rejoice against the root. The root's bearing you. If it weren't for uh, uh, that root, we wouldn't have any tree to be grafted in. So Israel. The Jews are a type of first fruit for God to reach the rest of the world. We ought to love uh, God's people and by the flesh. Uh, Paul's hope was that they would all get saved. That was his desire. My heart's desire for my kinsmen, my countrymen, is that they would get saved. <clears throat> the Jews are a type of first fruit. Go to 1 Corinthians 15. Jesus is a type of first fruit. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse number 20. But now is Christ risen from the dead and become the firstfruits of them that slept. For since by man came death, by man came also the resurrection of the dead. <clears throat> For as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. But every man in his own order, Christ the firstfruits, afterward they that are Christ at his coming, then cometh the end, when he shall deliver up the kingdom to God, even the Father, when he shall have put down all rule and all authority and power." Now, that's an obviously a condensed version of future events, but Christ is the first fruit of the resurrection. There's going to be others resurrect, but Christ is the first to uh, take part in that, and then those uh, that are in faith will also take part in the blessed resurrection. Hallelujah. We're going to rise up one of these days. Amen. And those that have gone on before, and some of us that are alive and remain, meet them in the clouds. That's the blessed hope. Don't ever be ashamed of our belief of eternity. I think uh, uh, a message, I, I don't want to give it away, but talk about just some, some of the unique points of Christianity. And that's one of them. We believe in a resurrection, not a reincarnation. We're not coming back here. Who wants to come back here your next life? Forget that. Uh, I mean, we'll come visit for a thousand years maybe, but uh, I'm not staying down here. I'm going to a, a better place. And, and uh, I wouldn't mind visiting the old... Uh, the old uh, building every once in a while, but I don't want to move back there, man. Uh, we got a new place, and we're going to have a new place, eternal place. The resurrection. Jesus is a type of first fruit. So our faith, um, the Jews, Jesus, and then go to Revelation 14. There's another group that's termed as first fruit, and it's the true Jehovah's Witnesses. Now, I've got to make sure that I define terminology. I totally confused everyone last week because of my terminology. And uh, thank you for Joshua. He's our, our, um, our accomplished scholar. And uh, uh, the word we were studying was diaconus. Diaconus, not deaconess. Diaconus, it's not a feminine word. It's not a uh, describing a lady like uh, I, when I pronounce it the way I did, it, it caused some confusion. But... Um, uh, here in Revelation 14, 4, we're not talking about the uh, American uh, congregation called the Jehovah's Witnesses, okay? But in Revelation 14, it's uh, reintroducing us to the same group in chapter 7, that were 12,000 out of each tribe. It gives us a little more description about them. Look at verse 1. <clears throat> and I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on the Mount Zion, and with him a hundred forty and four thousand having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven as the voice of many waters, 
and as the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sung as it were a new song before the throne and before the four beasts and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the 140 and 4,000 which were redeemed from the earth. Boy, isn't that interesting. It's a different song that we're going to sing. We're going to sing about being redeemed. They're going to sing another song. Verse 4. These are they which were not defiled with women, for they are virgins. These are they which follow the Lamb wherever, where, whithersoever he goeth. These were redeemed from among men, being the first fruits unto God and to the Lamb. And in their mouth was found no guile, for they are without fault before the throne of God. This group of 144,000 are termed as first fruits. And uh, maybe that's of those that have died in the tribulation. There's a bunch of souls that are waiting under the altar earlier on in Revelation that have been martyred during that Revelation tribulation time. But these 144,000, where are they at in verse number one? They're with the Lamb on Mount Zion. Is Jesus on earth any time during the tribulation? No. Jesus is not on earth. He's on the real Mount Zion. These 144,000 who have been on the earth preaching the gospel in chapter 14 are now in heaven. Just, just some uh, facts and figures for you. And so I believe that first fruits meaning these are the ones, first fruits from the tribulation that are alive and raptured or removed into heaven during that time. The church has already been raptured. That's why these guys are preaching the gospel. Because if the church hadn't been raptured, we'd be preaching the gospel. We'd be the ones sharing the, the story and the truth of what Jesus did. But here these guys are, and they're the ones, and they're called first fruits. So in Re Romans 16, Paul references some first fruits of that ministry in, in Achaia, if I pronounce that right. And uh, <clears throat> um, now you just got a little bit of uh, other knowledge or Bible study about first fruits. Okay, Old Testament, there's tons of first fruits. It mostly had to do with uh, their offerings and the first of their harvest. They would bring those in and that would belong to God. Next in Romans 16, it mentions another F. We've got first fruits in verse number five. Greet Mary who bestowed much labor on us. Salute Andronicus and Junia, my kinsmen and my fellow prisoners. My fellow prisoners, I, I told you that uh, <clears throat> I got a couple of letters just recently from guys that I'd never met, and they just thanked me, and I'm like, I haven't even met you. I haven't even been there. And they said, no, some folks that know you and, and been, there, been part of your church or uh, knew, knew before the pandemic, and well, we were in there, and uh, so they, he just wanted to thank, thank us for what we've been doing. There's something about being involved with not just a prison, but a situation where you feel like you're um, in bonds and you're together with someone. Y'all ever watched Amazing Race? Remember that, that show a long time ago? And you put some people together and then they go through this ordeal and all of a sudden they're their best friends or their worst enemies. I mean, either one happens when uh, they go through all those things together. When you are uh, <coughs> in... Um, Maybe uh, if you went to summer camp and, and then you met somebody and you're all there together away from home and all of a sudden you become friends because you're put in the same situation together that you normally wouldn't be. Paul recognizes those that were fellow prisoners with him. They must have been willing to go all the way to bonds for the faith and for preaching the truth and not back down no matter what it cost. Um, I just know that um, many people have told me, preacher, my church family is closer to me than my own family. Because you feel like you feel like you're in prison while I'm preaching. I know. There you go. I, I said it. I said it. You guys can just go with it. No, you feel like, wow, we are close because we're involved with this same purpose and this same cause of life. And so we feel this camaraderie together that we are fellow laborers. He mentions that these folks were fellow prisoners. They were willing to uh, give up their freedom for the true freedom that they found in Christ. Listen, we might not be called to uh, 
go to jail for our faith, but there are those who are being incarcerated for their faith. Brother John Walls was arrested on a Sunday morning in China, Easter Sunday morning. And they did a raid and took all the uh, Americans out and extradited them. You're out of the country and don't even try to, don't even fly passing through China is what they told John. You don't even make an entrance into our country again. So he goes to Taiwan. They speak Chinese and they, they're there and he's doing the same ministry. There, there is some hostility for a faith because the spiritual wickedness that's in high places knows exactly what that faith does. Don't ever think that the world's our friend. We've had many years of just kind of complacency from our world that we live in, in America. But don't ever underestimate, we do have an enemy who has spiritual wickedness in high places. That's what the book has always warned us about, isn't it? And so the fellow prisoner. Philemon in Colossians also mentions this, and, and Paul gave thanks for others that were fellow prisoners. Oh, I, I just know that if you've made yourself a prisoner for the Lord Jesus Christ in witnessing and working and doing something for him, there's a camaraderie, there's just a special bond that you have uh, as a fellow prisoner for Jesus Christ. Paul says, I'm a bond servant. I'm in bonds and, and uh, I've made myself a slave to the Lord Jesus Christ. I... Uh, I, I don't want to spiritualize that. I think it's literally they were in prison with Paul, but we can have that same thing. Last one, look at verse number, um, verse number 7. Salute them that were my fellow prisoners who were of note among the apostles. Even the apostles knew who these people were. It wasn't just Paul, so uh, they weren't just uh, Paul's favorite, but they were involved with ministry with other apostles. Then it says, who also were in Christ before me. They were first in Christ. Let's just, let's just figure out something here. Who, ha, who has been saved the longest in this room? If you were saved in the 90s, raise your hand. If you were saved in the 80s, raise your hand. That's me. If you were saved in the 70s, raise your hand. Oh, anybody saved in the 60s? How about the 50s? Ah, oh, Joyce! You, Nancy, when, what year were you saved? Fifty-six. Joyce, ah, Joyce wins. Joyce wins. I got a gift card for you right back here. You were first in Christ of all of us. Now, does that make her salvation more important than any of us? No, but you know what? There is something about longevity of having faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, and Paul recognizes here. They were in Christ before me. They were first in Christ, staying faithful and found of that same uh, longevity of living out what God has told them to do. And I just realized something happened that I always thought was the most annoying thing at funeral homes. You ever been in a funeral home and in a funeral and then the, the answer machine goes off in the funeral home? and somebody, It just happened in the office in there, so we got to figure out how to turn that thing down. I'm listening to somebody leaving a message over there while church is going on. But uh, um, the first in Christ, when you are, are saved and stay involved and stay faithful, I just believe there's some reward and some crown for that in, in the, the, the portals of heaven. Uh, n not that uh, any of us, uh, you know, ever, when you celebrate anniversary, it's great. But when someone has a 60th, it's a little greater. When someone has a 70th, you're like, oh, my goodness, how did that happen? And if anyone had an 80th year anniversary, they ought to give that lady a prize for living that long with some other man. Amen. Uh, there's just something. The higher you go, the more, what they call it, a silver and then a gold and then a, uh, a two by four. Amen. A two by four anniversary. That's how much it's worth uh, after you get past the gold. Uh, yes, yes. And when you are saved and still uh, serving, it, it just puts the proof in the pudding. Amen. So he noticed, notices there, it's not that they were um, um, any uh, more important, but he recognizes they were in Christ before me. I wanna, he says, I want to thank the Lord for them. They were in Christ even before I was. And they uh, were appreciated and mentioned in Romans chapter 16. Good stuff. Amen.
every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, thank you for the time that we get to share, contemplate the um, uh, scriptures that you've put before us. And I'm sure there are much better messages and much better um, thoughts from these verses, but thank you for what we get to share today together. I pray that you would help us to be found faithful and fruitful and that we would be in someone's thank you list at the end of their ministry. That maybe somebody would say, hey, I just want to thank you for so-and-so that uh, stayed faithful and stayed fruitful in